Good morning everyone. How are we doing? So far so good? Brilliant. Okay, well it's my pleasure today talking about payments and solutions for uh, for digital business. Of course he'll be talking about world pay as well because that's what he does <laughs> every day. Hopefully not seven days a week. <laughs> and um, well Jason has got huge amount of experience from the infrastructure side of things to the front end of technology when it comes to financial firms. So there will be a lot that we're going to learn about payment and also some of the trends and things that are happening in today's industry. Again, most of it will be around financial firms as well, financial industry. But I'm very pleased that he has decided to take time off his very, very busy life <coughs> to come over and talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very you. much. So, um, Please do, if you have any questions as I go along, just shut my hand up or shout or whatever. I have no idea whether I'll have time at the end or not, because uh, I haven't timed this. However, we shall see. Uh, from experience, it should fill an hour if you, uh, if you do get a bit interactive with me. I will pause at the end for questions, but, but don't wait. So, uh, WorldPay is a company that I work for. I'm going to uh, explain to you a bit about WorldPay, uh, who we are, what we do. Uh, and that will therefore help inform you guys around how payments work, particularly credit card payments and how that fits in with e-commerce and, and doing your own digital enterprises. Um, we're going to talk about uh, who WellPay is, what we do, where we came from, so a bit of history and where we're going. So I'll actually finish on some of the trends uh, that we're seeing in payments and where they may go in the near future. So who are who we are? Starting with uh, with Jason Scott Taggart. Who is Jason Scott Taggart? So I was born in 1970, and there wasn't a lot of interesting stuff to do in the 70s. None of you will remember. Uh, this is actually a photo of myself, my brother, my cousin walking on the M25 before it was opened. So that's how old I am. That was what we did for fun in the 70s. We walked on motorways before they were opened. So. Um, <laughs> What that actually meant was that when my father brought home a computer in 1976, when I was six years old, I thought this thing was amazing. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I was playing a game, I can remember it now, it was zombies, and it was zeros and x's being chased around a, a screen about this big. So that's when I got the bug for technology. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to talk much more about me. We'll get into the fascinating world of payments in a minute. Um, so, that meant I got the bug, and I, I knew about computers and had an exposure to it before any of my friends at school did, which was great. I then, when I was choosing what to do for a degree, when I was choosing my A-levels and, and where to go to university, uh, there were loads of companies saying, come and work for us on our grad scheme, we'll convert you to being a computer programmer. So we said, don't matter what your degree's in, so I went, fantastic, I'll do a degree in something that I'm interested in other than computers, and then come back to computers. So I did a degree in politics at Liverpool University, um, graduated into one of the biggest recessions, thank you very much Margaret Thatcher, and in the recession these big companies said, sort of, we don't even want you if you've got a computer science degree. So I suddenly thought, oops, what have I done? Um, I've gone off on a politics tangent, so I worked for an MP, I was a researcher in the House of Commons, um, but when I did that I applied for a Masters. So I did a Masters in uh, Artificial Intelligence Expert Systems, uh, so it was a glorified computer science degree. Um, it's my proudest moment, you'll be interested to hear, those of you doing a Masters. I, I did more work in that one year of my Masters than I did in three years of a politics degree. Um, and I was the only person on the course who hadn't done computer science as an undergraduate degree. So I had to work even harder because I didn't have that computer science. Anyway, that's enough about me. I then went into various jobs in finance, so that's the, that, we just skipped 18 years and then we've got another 20, so. Who is WorldPay? That's more interesting. So WorldPay, this is our, our mission statement, our vision, to be the world's most progressive and reliable payments partner, sharing insights and helping customers prosper. Now that doesn't mean um, too much to you, the, the key thing there is we're a payments company and I'm going to explain what that actually means in a way that you can understand. What I wanted to get over is a bit about the culture about WorldPay. So you can see from this that we've brought this vision statement to life. We've tried to work out what each word in this means to us as a technology firm. Uh, we're about 5,000 people worldwide, um, but we are actually a series of small companies in a way that have come together. 
uh, and we get this great balance of a, a large institution and, and leveraging the scale that that gives you, but with small teams that are very focused, very innovative. And that comes through onto how we do our technology development as well. Um, deciding where I go with this, I'm a technologist, so I could have gone very techy. I haven't. I've majored more on the business, the e-commerce, and the payments. Um, but just to give you a flavour, uh, for those of you that are interested in the more techy side of e-commerce and about how you might do web design and, and the, the factors behind it, we are a very agile um, dev, DevOps kind of organisation. So here's some of the ones that, that have a similar kind of ethos. There's Spotify, um, it, one of the visuals there is about how they do their development, Netflix. Um, so if you are interested and you want to know what the hot topics are, go and, go and do a, a, a wiki search on Agile. Agile means that we have lots of small teams that have um, small tasks that they go and develop. So they're called sprints, and you have six people in the team, and a sprint is normally two weeks. So they're given a task to do at the beginning of the sprint, and then in two weeks later they've delivered. And we do we have parallel about 30 to 40 sprints going at any one time with our development teams, and those teams tend to stand together. I'm going to share these slides, uh, so I'm not expecting you to be able to read that. Most of them uh, won't be for reading anyway, but I will, I will make this available to you guys afterwards so you can, for those of you that are interested, can look at it. Um, so that's who I am and who WorldPay are at a high level, but let's explain better what WorldPay is by, by going into what we actually do as a company. If you don't remember anything else, Remember this. this, if you just go away and, and this makes sense to you after you leave this room, then my job is done uh, and you will go away a little bit wiser. So we are what's called a merchant acquirer, which sounds very quaint and old fashioned that our customers, we refer to them as merchants. We have about half a million customers, so we are, we are quite a big uh, part of the economy and I'll go on to some figures that explain that. And we're part of the four party model. So let me explain this workflow. Um, because a lot of people don't understand that when you use a credit card or a debit card in a machine or on a website, there's actually an awful lot of stages in the transaction that goes on behind that. So let's, uh, let's go shopping with this young lady, the consumer up in the top left. She's gone to Tesco's to do her weekly grocery shopping. Um, she puts them in a trolley and she takes them. Number one is she goes to the cash uh, till, the cashier. So she decides she wants to pay by credit card. So she, the, the cashier rings it all up. Um, she puts her card into the machine at the till. Then what happens is Tesco is one of our customers. So every single credit card transaction that Tesco does comes, number two, down to WorldPay. So their, their tills are connected by computers to us. Um, let's say our shopping was £100. Uh, the information comes down to WorldPay that says um, Miss Smith wants to pay £100 on her Visa credit card that's from uh, HSBC Bank. What we do, and this is the bit that people don't know about, people sort of know about Visa and MasterCard, people know that people have banks that they get credit cards from, so I'm just trying to get over what's the value add that WorldPay gives as the merchant acquirer. If you think about it, there are lots of types of credit cards, and there are thousands, tens of thousands of banks that are issuing those credit cards. Tesco, let alone Tesco, but definitely the uh, news agents on the corner who has one till, they do not want to have a relationship with every bank, even every scheme, as we call it, every credit card. So what they do is, well, that's why we're a merchant acquirer, because we acquire all of those merchants. The transaction, Tesco, does all their business with WorldPay, and WorldPay settles everything with Tesco. So Miss Jones or Miss Smith, I've just checked, I've just rechristened her, Miss Smith, was doing £100, um, comes down to WorldPay, we go, okay, we know that number, that's a Visa card. So we go to Visa and we say, Miss Smith from uh, HSBC wants on your Visa, she wants £100. Visa goes, all right, yeah, that card's HSBC. So they go down four to HSBC, who issued the card, and say, can Miss Smith put £100 on her credit card? HSBC say, yep, that's fine. Visa say, yep, that's fine. WorldPay says, yes, that's fine. And actually, that all happens in one or two seconds when you finish putting your pin in and you press the green button. Okay? So you see, you know how limited the time is there. These days, the transaction is very swift, but it's actually going all the way back there. So the first thing that we do is that Tesco only have to deal with us. Yeah? 
So at the end of the day, we say to Tesco, okay, all of the credit cards and all the debit cards you did equal X amount of money, we will now give you that money, and we give it en masse. And then what we do is we go by the schemes into the issuing banks and we go and collect all of that money behind the scenes. So we have a relationship with all of the schemes and all of the banks, but the merchants don't have to. And we, we therefore take a very small percentage of each transaction to provide that service as do the scheme, as do the bank. So we share the money between us that we charge on each of those transactions. So the first thing is that we, they only have to deal with us. The second very important thing is that we take the risk for them as well. So, if you ever get your credit card bill and you see something on there and you thought, I never bought that, I was never in HMV buying DVDs of whatever, um, you dispute it, you phone them up and you say, that wasn't me. Uh, I haven't been to Thailand this week or whatever, so that, you dispute the transaction. When you phone your bank and dispute it, you don't know, but they put you through to us. And it's actually us. The onus is on us to prove that you did or didn't do that. And we try and protect the merchants, that's who our primary person is, and the banks try and protect the consumer. So the banks will try and prove that that person didn't do it, we'll try and check whether they did or not with the, with the merchant there. So it's a bit of insurance, that's the other thing that we give, is that we, we and that holds with us, if, if nobody can prove it, then we swallow it. Because we always default to the consumer being looked after, everybody does. So from a merchant point of view, they will actually um, pay us a small fee because each transaction they're buying insurance that when there is a problem, we actually settle it. So does that make sense? Is anybody still listening? Yes, <laughs> okay. Right. And the reason why this is important is because people don't realise that this is going on behind the scenes. But if you think about it, you know about MasterCard and Visa, but you've heard of probably Diner, you've heard of Amex, yeah? And there are, there are a few hundred other schemes like that. Every country around the world has different preferences around what their schemes, as we're called, are. And as I said, you obviously know that in every country there's hundreds of banks, so around the world there's tens of thousands of banks that are giving those cards out. Is there any question on that before? I'm so keen to make sure you understand that, if nothing else. Is there any questions on that? Yes? If you use a Tesco credit card in Tesco, yes. does it still go through you? Yes. So the question was, if we use a Tesco credit card in Tesco, does it go through us? The answer is yes. The reason is actually Tesco uh, Bank is actually a, a front for, a, for another, I can't remember which one it is, but it's actually a different bank that's issuing that and they've just marketed it as Tesco. But anyway, if I went into a bank and bought something in the bank, if they sold it, so if I bought a, um, uh, an insurance policy of a banker and they charged it to my card, it would still go back through a merchant acquirer. Then nobody, even the biggest, so Tesco is a real example, they're a customer of ours and most of the big supermarkets are, they always have a merchant acquirer. There's always somebody aggregating that. They never have a direct relationship with the scheme or with the banks. Any other questions? No? Okay. Moving on. So, some stats around WorldPay. Um, we're growing, uh, though we're one of the, we're the biggest in the UK and in Europe. Uh, we're in the top 10 of global merchant acquirers. Um, so we're number five at the moment, there you go. We're half a million customers, but we're adding uh, 400, 500 a day. Um, and they're of all sizes. As I said, you've got all the supermarkets and the very big um, stores at one end, you've got most of them, but you've also got them every size through to uh, people selling things in a market where they're actually using a Bluetooth card swiper connected to their smartphone. Um, we have merchants of all size, shapes and sizes. We're also a bit of a secret in the economy. Um, so one pound in every eight of the UK's GDP goes through world pay. So an eighth of all transactions and payments um, contributing to the economy here goes through us. So people know about cash points, and, and when they, you see in the headlines and the stories when they get in the press when a, when a cash point can't work for 24 hours, one of the banks. Um, so imagine the nightmares I have as a technology infrastructure person worrying about the, uh, the, the tills, etc., going down uh, for all of those guys. That adds up to uh, we are 44% of all credit card transactions in the UK, and we are 
50% of Visa Euro. So all, half of every Visa transaction, half of all the Visa transactions across the whole of Europe come through WorldPay. This is, this is an important one uh, in the topic of e-commerce. What, what I wanted to get over with this slide is uh, an idea of the different products that we sell, the services we provide, so you as future business people can have an idea of why you might want different payment systems. Yeah? So the, the full party model that I took you through, uh, the model there was point of sale, as we call POS. Point of sale is when you actually have the physical card present and you're putting it in the machine or you're contactless, but you're there with the card and you're talking face to face with the, uh, with the merchant. That's mainly through the production acquiring platform, as it's called. So we're a merchant acquirer. That's our huge uh, platform with uh, mainframe computers behind it doing high volume transactions. Everything comes through here. So you've got your big supermarkets like Tesco, Next, and other shops doing that. But we have um, four other main gateways, which are more for the online transactions. So not a terminal in a shop, but actually on different kinds of websites. The first one is our, our main standard one, the World Pay, uh, Worldwide Payment Gateway. So this is a, a generic website payment gateway. So when you design a website, you would get a relationship with the merchant acquirer who will, tra who will process your transactions. Um, and if you have normal standard requirements, and you'll see what non-normal are, non-standard are in a second, um, this is the gateway we, we put you towards. And therefore your developers will have an API, they will have some generic code modules that they drop into their website, and you go and fill in your credit card details and it passes it through to, uh, to us. And just a bit on that experience, you're all used to, um, when you pay for something on a credit card on a website, you often then get a security uh, check coming up and that will often be a password that you'll then have to put through. That's the same four party model. So if we've gone back to Visa or we've gone back to the issuing bank and they said, actually can you do this extra check, you're seeing a window through that process as they come through and say, no, you have to do this extra bit before we will uh, uh, authorise the transaction. Um, so, we do it for a lot of airlines, uh, we do it for Skype, and we do it for a lot of gambling sites. But, in fact, a lot of our gambling sites use this next one, the high capacity gateway. So, as the name suggests, high capacity, this is one where you get spiky traffic. So, um, and that's why a lot of gambling sites use it. So, it was Cheltenham Cup last week, for those of you who like your horse racing. So there's a big spike uh, in gambling in the horse races, normally just before the races as well. So these computers have to be able to deal with transactions going trickling along from tens of transactions to going up to thousands per second. And it, it has to be able to deal with a very erratic volume coming through. And that's why you get Netflix. So for example, um, when they launched the, the new series of House of Cards, everybody at midnight goes to go and try and download the House of Cards and start watching that. So we have to be able to deal with that coming through. Uh, Sony, PlayStation, um, the uh, Sony Play environment, if you pay to play on, on uh, a PS4 uh, or on an Xbox, because Microsoft is a customer as well, um, again, when the um, Call of Duty next version comes out at midnight, Everybody's jumping on trying to buy that game online. So they have very spiky traffic. Um, the next one is the World Pay Alternative Payments, uh, WKAP. Alternative payments are the weird and wonderfuls. So um, if, for example, somebody wants to um, pay with uh, government benefit credits, or somebody wants to pay with food tokens, or um, my personal favourite is in Russia there's a lot of um, uh, pay ca phone cards are used to actually pay for cash transactions. So they'll go and uh, buy scratch cards in the news agents, go home, scratch it off and just like an Amazon voucher or whatever you'll have a code and you punch it in and you use that. Uh, it's very good for money laundering. So um, there, there are, the, what the alternative payments is, is that we have a very large number of different connections out the back of that. So instead of just going to the Visa, Mastercard, sort of having big pipes to these very standard ways of paying, we have loads of gateways out to these weird and wonderful different ways. So we can settle with those on behalf of the, uh, of the customer. 
The last one um, is YesPay, which is now called WorldPayTotal. And you might, if you go into M&S or to Jigsaw, you might see WorldPayTotal being started to be branded. What this does is, it's what, what we call omni-channel. And omni-channel is one of the big buzzwords uh, in e-commerce at the moment. That means getting the same customer experience regardless of which channel you choose to purchase by. So whether I go to the counter in Jigsaw and buy my blouse there, uh, and the till and what I get with my loyalty points for, for them and what I get for my special offers, the fact that they've got my home address if they're going to do delivery, is exactly the same as on the website or on the mobile app. Uh, and the benefit there is that you start to not worry about where the interaction starts and where it ends. So for example, I might go onto the Jigsaw website, I find the blouse that matches the colour in my eyes, I decide that that's definitely the one I'm going to wear to the party, um, but I don't want it now, so what I do is I press the button and say I'm going to collect it in the store. And I go into the store and they go, my Jason, that really matches your eyes, that was a good choice there. Um, here you go, and they knew it was me because my details came up on the till, and then put the transaction had actually started on a website. And what Omnichannel is about trying to get the same experience and sharing that knowledge. So this is a special gateway that will link the point of sale with the website. So these are, these are our top level, we have other specialist ones as well, but these are the kind of range of services and this is why it's important that we have this because we have to deal with the merchant who's in the market still through to the supermarket and the airline. And there's some more of the names to show you some of the, the big customers that we have. Get off the marketing slide. So, um, understand a little bit more about what we do and how we got here and I'll also come on to talk about why we're a bit different we'll give you a bit of history so WorldPay as an organization started in 2010 but that wasn't really the beginning because we came out of Royal Bank of Scotland in 2010 as a new company and the joke was that we were the largest startup on the street because we were about 4,000 people that came out of Royal Bank of Scotland um, to do this payment but actually, we were originally started in 1989 um, as Streamline. So Streamline was a, was a payments company that started originally with the airlines and with petrol stations. Airlines and petrol stations were amongst the first to need to do fancier things with credit cards. If you think about petrol stations, you've got lots of people buying things on an account, so they, you have lots of professional drivers, taxi drivers, lorry drivers, who don't, shouldn't have to be paid for the petrol themselves, they wanted to go to the company that they work for. So we helped set up the first networks of communications for them to do that live, rather than using, none of you remember, but we used to have kachink kachink machines with, pe with paper, and then it would take a few days for your credit card bills to come through. So we started originally as a company that helped the petrol stations and the airlines, because the airlines have a lot of people, obviously they need the reason why they needed to go beyond paper was because they were international. So they wanted ways to do those transactions quickly around the world. So that's, that's where our history was. We're also the first in the UK, there's quite a series of firsts here, EMV, which is the uh, contactless. So having a chip, chip and pin on the card, we were the first people in the UK to do that. So we have quite a proud history uh, of development and pushing innovation. So when we became part of RBS, we got bought uh, around 2000, we then started to factor, uh, factor more on the internet, you've got the growth of contactless, um, we started going more global, so we're still one of the few people that can take China Union Pay, which is one of the most common uh, credit cards in China, so we're the only ones, one of the few who can take that globally. Um, and then in 2015, so October last year, we actually floated, so we were privately owned when we were spun off from RBS, we were spun off from RBS, for those of you that might remember, uh, because of the financial crisis in 2008, so RBS were forced to sell off some of their businesses um, as part of the deal with the government, the European government, to get money. So we were bought by uh, venture capitalists who have pumped half a billion pounds, 500 million pounds, into people, process and technology for us to keep that competitive advantage. And I'll, I'll go a little bit into that in a second as well. So that brings you up to date, though. That's, and that's our strap line. We want to be leaders in modern money. Um, a little diversion before I go any further. So uh, I was having lunch in your canteen, which is a downside nicer than any canteen I've ever been in a university before, so well done on that. Um, 
Two things, I went up to the till and I said, do you have a minimum transaction? She looked at me as if I was mad. <laughs> so, um, she said, no, why? That, only a few, actually I said five years, but only a couple of years ago, you would have had no minimum transaction, 10 pounds if you want to use a credit card or a debit card. Um, so I bought some chewing gum on my credit card and I was able to thankfully say that you are a well-paid customer as well. So therefore I didn't flounce off in a tantrum and say I'm not going to speak to those people if you're not a well-paid customer. <laughs> um, the way I will now turn you into receipts nerds um, by telling you that the way you tell is on the receipt on your credit card there are various code numbers that, that you'll see on there. One of them is merchant ID, yeah. so uh, an MID. The merchant ID and the other one, TID, the TID is the terminal ID. So the terminal ID is the unique identifier for the, the box that you put your card into. The merchant ID is the unique identifier for the uh, company that you just bought from. So Tesco, for example, have one of those numbers, regardless of which terminal you're in. If it ends in a two or a three, it's well paid. Yay! <laughs> so, so I've been working for WorldPay for two years. My kids are now uh, receipt nerds. Whenever we go into anywhere, they, they instantly grab the receipt from me and they look to see if the merchant ID is a two or a three, and then they tell me whether I'm allowed to eat there again or not. So, um, so there you go. So have a look at the receipt at least once. Look, you know, hand it to me once and look at the next receipt. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll talk a bit about where we're going, both World Pay as an organisation, and then I'll talk more generically about payments and uh, the, the industry. So, we have um, Ambition 2020, which is our roadmap for the, what's the next five years from last year, that we're, we're now a year into. And for us, unsurprisingly, um, it, what do we want from World Pay? We want more world and we want more pay. So it's a very easy strategy for, for those of us internally to understand. So we want to keep adding new schemes, so different kinds of cards from around the world. Like I said, nearly everybody's heard of Visa and MasterCard, but actually if you go to Brazil, most people don't use those. So for example, or, uh, in each country you go to, there's a different balance of what's the favourite. Um, alternative payment methods are only increasing. The, the number of ways that uh, you can buy and sell things and what you transact uh, is actually becoming more diverse, so we need to do that. More domestic licences, what we mean by that is we want the ability to be merchant acquirers in more countries. So we can do transactions over most countries in the world, but actually if we want to have a direct relationship with a company, we need to have a licence in, in that country to operate. Um, we are, for example, another proud claim, we're the only um, non-domestic uh, merchant acquirer in Japan. And we're the only one in Japan that isn't a bank as well. So they're all Japanese banks is the only other people you can do business with in Japan. And for those of you that know any industry, how hard it is to do as a non-domestic to do business in Japan, that was really hard to do. Um, I'll just give you a little insight as well to how hard. Not only do we have to change all our systems to uh, Japanese characters, which is very unusual. Most countries were happy with English. Um, Judgment of whether that's right or not is not for me to say. Um, but the other thing as a technologist that was quite frightening was that they have to do payments clearing with faxes. So we were having to actually put a fax gateway into our payment system so that there were fax... You don't even know what faxes are, do you, Huffy? It's all right. <laughs> they're, they're like a, a photocopier, but stuck, stuck at the end of email. Um, so that, that, was, that was quite interesting. But we're, as technologists, we're quite proud that we got that working. Um, so more world, so we want a bigger footprint uh, going to more territories and more payments. So more ways of meeting the, uh, the cust customer's needs around how they want to do business. As we said, that omni-channel bit, it shouldn't matter where it starts, you want to maintain that way of transaction, you want to make it easier for people to shop with you. To do that, uh, you have to know what your customers need. So. Here are some of the trends in the industry around what the customers are telling us that they, that they want more of. So we're needing to use the vast amounts of data. If you think about it, we, we have billions of transactions a year that we, uh, that we record. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we can mine those to actually tell the consumers, tell the merchants what is happening and, and go to them with offerings that make more sense to them. And, and people are expecting us to do that. People expect us to know stuff around what they're doing. We talked about omnichannel, so seamless regardless of where you do it. 
Also, because we've got all those different gateways, uh, we have customers that started with us on terminals, but then have started having websites. Then they've actually said, well, we've got some spiky traffic, so we want it on the high capacity gateway, but they want a single view of all of that. And that sounds obvious, but actually it's quite a challenge sometimes to bring that all together in a dashboard or in reports that make it easy for you to understand. Um, our customers are local and they are global. So therefore, uh, finding ways for them to be able to settle in different currencies, settle in different ways, uh, is important. And mobile, I don't need to tell you, is, is, uh, is now taken as a given. Also, as you will have seen from other technologies that are slowly but surely dying like checks, people are more keen and eager for things to settle there and then. They don't understand why they have to wait three days for a transaction to go from there to there. So a lot of the back-end systems are having to be invested in heavily so that we can actually do that in more real time. Um, alternative payments, another example of people, uh, I assume you've all heard of Bitcoin. So do you own any Bitcoin? No? Really? Come see me. They're not telling me. Come see me afterwards, I'll save you some. So, okay. Um, Bitcoin, we can accept Bitcoin if you wanted to buy things via that. So, and then you will see more of those uh, examples, not fewer, as we go forward. Loyalty schemes, so you're all used to your Boots Advantage cards and your uh, air miles if you fly off. And, um, those schemes, people want them to be embedded in the transactions as well. Uh, the best experience is actually when, if you go and buy something in a shop, and they know who you are, so you get the loyalty points, etc., at your Starbucks or whatever, but you don't have to get a separate card out and get it stamped or a separate card out and get that. So, what we're trying to do is embed them together as part of that omni channel piece as well. So, we know more about you and we make it easier for you to do business with us. Um, giving them options. Now, a very common one that's forgotten, but we're very good at, is prevention of fraud as well. So, one of the reasons that we've steadily carried on growing is because we've got quite clever smarts in our gateways to prevent fraud. So therefore, we have fewer examples of where the merchants lose out on transactions. They have a higher success rate, and they have um, more examples of the fraud being stopped at the time of it happening, rather than us having to do the, uh, the, the uh, process that I mentioned earlier about disputing it and working it out, because that obviously adds cost to everybody because you have to have people doing it. So we have algorithms that look at where you're buying it, uh, have you bought from there before? Is that an unusual value for you? Um, can we do a credit card check? Can we actually see if you're on the electoral register? And these are all checks that can be done on your transaction in that real time when you're actually pressing the button on a website. So again, high um, performance computers that allow us to do that very quickly and allow us to do it anywhere around the world as well. So a lot of that fraud, uh, for historical reasons, we do out of uh, North America. We have computers there that we're particularly good at it. But we do that for a transaction for a Japanese uh, merchant acquirer as well. So Japanese person uses the credit card, phew, gets checked in, in North America, bash, it goes back. So these are some of the things that the customers are expecting us to do. And therefore, we've invest, uh, invested large amounts of money in changing our back-end systems. Coming out of RBS uh, and being an independent company gives us a great advantage over a lot of our competitors. So we're number five in the world at the moment. The other four um, are all in big banks like RBS. So they're in Chase, they're in uh, JP Morgan, there are other in large organisations. They tend to be on 1980s mainframes in a neglected part of that bank uh, where they're seen as a sort of steady but low revenue. We've had venture capitalist private equity investment, which has meant that we've taken all of that back end out and built brand new. And the brand new system we've done was designed from scratch to be global, so it can take any currency from any uh, location. It doesn't actually do cash and credit card transactions. It, what it does is it exchanges value. And uh, that sounds a bit odd, but what I'm saying by that is that the, the units, the thing that you're exchanging, does not have to be pounds, shillings and pence. It doesn't have to be cash. It could be Bitcoin. It could be bullion. It could be anything. So it's, a, it's an engine to exchange value between two parties. It's omni-channel, so we don't care whether you're coming in on the phone, on a mobile, on a, a, a tablet, or on a terminal. And we've designed it from scratch that we can mine the data. So a big thing for us going forward, big data, and being able to do clever searches across that uh, is important and is real-time, so we can settle straight away. 
that's where WorldPay is going. These are some of the um, topics that are out there in the industry at the moment and WorldPay are trying to take advantage of as well. Have you heard of the phrase, the Internet of Things? Yes, some nods. So, um, what we're talking about here with WorldPay Within is, is around the Internet of Things. It's around uh, embedding the ability to do payments transactions into the smallest of objects. Yeah? You've all heard the example of the fridge noticing that you've run out of beer and therefore it goes and orders some beer from the, the supermarket and it gets delivered. Yeah? To do that, I know I say you've all heard that, then some of you are looking at me as if I'm mad. Okay, a common example of the internet of things is that you will have a fridge so that when you've noticed that you run out of beer, it orders some more beer for you. Um, if it's going to do that, it has to pay for the beer that it's just ordered. All right? Now, it's not much of a leap to think about um, how you could do that. You know, you could have a website and it could do the transaction, but actually, you're starting to get into the realms of machines making the decision of doing payments for you. And that's where it's conceptually a bit different. And if we do that on scale and we do it in large, um, in diverse ways and frequently, that's a large amount of value that's moving around just on rules based on computers. So it starts getting into a world where you need to be careful about that, but it gets very exciting as well. Um, there's, there's a theory around optimising the efficiency of industry uh, around if you could do micropayments for that, and this has been modelled by, uh, by some, um, many in manufacturing, where you, where you obviously through robotics etc, we've got a long history of trying to optimise the efficiency of a production line, of building a car or whatever. The, the theory is, if each of the um, components in that production line could open a market for its services, you could even have self-optimizing production lines. So for example, if I say, okay, I will put this door onto this car for uh, half a penny, but the robot next to me goes, actually I can do it quicker and I'm going to just charge you 0.3 of a penny, then the person on the production line, or not the person, the, the, the robot that's on the one down, will go, okay, I'll give my business to the 0.3. So the, the machine that has worked out how to do it faster will start getting more business. So it's bringing markets into how production lines are done. You can extend that to anything. If you start having chips in other items, then you can have uh, self-optimizing markets. You can have things going out and buying things on your behalf going across the internet. But they will have to be able to do transactions in a, in a predictable way and you will have to pay for it at some point. So you have to be happy with how it's doing it on your behalf. So that's very exciting and we're working with a lot of the chip manufacturers around how we can put that payments uh, intelligence into the chips that are then used in mobile phones and la la la. Identity. We're doing a lot of work on this because at the end of the day, if you distill down what I've just explained to you about what we do, that transfer of value, the most important thing on that is identifying the two parties. Yeah? I cannot transfer value from this person to that person in a guaranteed way unless I know who I'm taking it from and who I'm giving it to. And if I'm challenged afterwards, if it's disputed, I have to show how I decided who that person was and who that person was. So actually, the most important thing that we do as a payments company is we know about identity. And that's how we're good at fraud protection as well, because we do a lot of effort in making sure that we've got that identity piece right. And that's, that's got easier. Um, in, in chip and pin, for example, the introduction and that becoming uh, ubiquitous in, in the UK at least, means that it's slashed fraud dramatically. Most card fraud happens at point of sale and happened with um, people not doing signatures properly, not paying attention. With the introduction of you having to put a pin in overnight, that pretty much got rid of most credit card fraud. In America, where we don't have EMV yet, they're, they're still trying to roll it out, card fraud is 10, 20 times worse than anywhere else in the world. So, carrying on that with, as you can imagine, with biometrics, so those of you who used to on your smartphone using touch to, to log in, etc., that's becoming more and more common. It's been with us as a concept for a long, long time, but we're starting to do stuff around face recognition. Uh, we've got some um, readers that we've been testing that actually look at the veins in your fingers, not the fingerprint, because a fingerprint is easier to fake than the, the vein structure in your finger. 
Um, so we're looking at that, and that's good for points of sale. So when you're in the canteen, because there's obviously large amounts of fraud trying to buy puddings, um, but you, you go into the canteen and you can do point of sale in that way. Um, the face recognition is really good as well with the loyalty. So you have H&H, um, &H, a coffee store uh, that we're working with, where you walk into the store, it looks at your face and it goes, oh, it's Jason. Jason normally has a white uh, Americano, uh, medium size. And if I come up to there and they say, there you go, Jason, there's your regular, and it charges it to my cart because I've pre-approved it. So you get a better shopping experience, but we also reduce fraud and you get the win-win of that. So identity is a, is a big thing that we're trying to improve. Software is eating the world as well. So uh, long, our history you know, predominantly was terminals. Then the web came along in the 90s and we, we um, uh, created those gateways for e-commerce. Um, what's happening now though is that the, the, the point of sale is becoming more and more flexible. So not everybody has the same kind of terminals that you're used to seeing, but they'll have their own kind of till. Or most people, a lot of people want to use their own tablet. They want to use their laptop. They don't want to even have a cash till. Yeah. So um, what we're seeing here is that, that we're focusing heavily on making sure that the software that we produce can go onto multi-platforms and then we can be uh, agnostic around the hardware. We don't really care what that point of sale hardware is, we'll leave that to other experts. There's also interesting things happening around value exchange. So Interledger is one example that we're working with. Um, what they're doing is they're trying to make it easy for you to transfer value from one kind of product to another. So the example that we put there is that an Uber taxi rider has taken Japanese yen, uh, transferring it to Avios, which is British Airways Airpoints, um, to pay for a haircut. So what the, what the internet is doing there is now you need to go through various different steps, saying what the FX, the foreign exchange value is between a haircut compared to some air miles, uh, and allow people to do more interesting exchange of value. So it's like going back to the old bartering system uh, before you had you know, uh, currency ubiquitous, um, and allowing people. Now that's particularly exciting as well if you're going across countries. If you can do that in a way where you're happy that you're getting the right value for whatever you're transferring, then that makes it easy for me to buy things in other countries without having to do uh, foreign exchange. And the last thing, that I mentioned in innovation that we're looking at. Um, so you've heard of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. For us, the exciting thing is not around Bitcoin as a, a cryptocurrency itself, and there are others as well. Bitcoin is just one named example. It's the technology that underpins that. It's called the blockchain. Um, increasingly, it's referred to as the shared ledger. So. For us, this is the exciting thing. It's the technology that Bitcoin uses, not Bitcoin and that specific uh, example. It's called a shared ledger because effectively, all Bitcoin does is it notes that transaction. And then once that transaction has been logged, that you've given this amount of Bitcoin has gone from Fred to Jane, yeah, that gets added to the blockchain. So it gets added to a ledger like the old like an accountant's ledger, but it's on the internet, it's in the cloud. And that's the great thing about it, is that once it's made, it can't be then undone. Because it's dispersed, it's distributed, and therefore you cannot fraud it, because that's gone around the world. That is exciting because it's giving lots of ideas about other ways, other things that you can do shared ledgers. So there are a lot of financial institutions that are looking at alternative ways of doing um, shares, so stock exchanges, um, doing funds, uh, fund management, doing mortgages. So if you want to transfer a, a large amount of money from one person to another, at the moment you have to have a scary phone call to somebody who then telephones it through and you sit there and panic for an hour whilst you wait to hear that the £200,000 has gone from there to there. Actually, we could maybe do this in a public shared ledger where it would happen instantly and you would be safe about doing it. This will not automatically overnight change our lives, but there's a big sense that this is actually going to, over time, revolutionise a lot of the things that we do in the same way that the internet has. Yeah? The internet, if you think about it, 
Um, when, I, when I was at school in the 80s, if somebody had sort of tried to explain to me that the uh, majority of business would have been transacted over this public cloud of telecommunications, you would have been sort of, don't be ridiculous, there's no way you've got to have, you know, line-to-line -line communications that are totally secure. Um, this is similar for those kind of transactions in your banking and your finance. It, it could revolutionise it and it could make it cheaper because it will commoditise it. Um, in the same way that uh, the internet has done for so many other things. So we're, nobody yet has come up with the, the, the killer what this is going to be. Bitcoin serves a purpose, um, but, but we, we think there's going to be a lot more of, uh, examples of this. So do we know if there is anyone sort of experimenting with blockchain anywhere in the world, like the specific examples? The, all the banks are. Um, because the banks are terrified that it might disintermediate them, so therefore the, they, they want to make sure that they're utilising. My personal thought is that it won't, or it won't for a long time, because there's still a lot around the identity at either end that you, you want to, you know, who am I transacting with and, and, and um, why. But they are doing it to try and get rid of paperwork or to try and get rid of um, convoluted uh, workflow. So this actually can be quite an efficient way for you to, to, to log all of that stuff and not have to have vast expensive computers to keep a track of it because you can always go back to it because it will be out there as a public uh, statement of, of fact or more than likely not public but shared between parties. So at the moment where you have um, dark pool trading, so dark pool trading is where a group of financial institutions are, are trading with each other, that would be a shared ledger. So they, the, the, the way that they might make it a lot, lot cheaper for them to do that together is through a shared ledger. And that, that's, that's where the most real applications are happening today. So, the, so there are two fundamental things in here. There, there is, first and foremost, the infrastructure to support it. And then secondly, the, actually the issue with the, you know, with the privacy and data and all of it. Because yeah. I mean, data sitting in that infrastructure that you need to have, you know, to be able to, to use it and share it with yeah, so, so the infrastructure is an immediate cost save and that's because the technology is not that complicated. Yeah. If you could, I find it complicated, but those <laughs> no more than me done. That's why it's now we talk about it more as a shared ledger, because the privacy part of it is actually you're doing it between trusted parties. So it's not it's not like the block it's not like Bitcoin which is totally public. Um, it's designed most Real applications so far have been within a community. Um, okay, and what I wanted to end on then, this is me really finishing, is just we, we've got the Ambition 2020, which is our sort of uh, five year plan from starting last year. Um, something we like to think about is that the, the Olympics is in Tokyo in 2020. Um, how different might payments be at that event? I, I don't know, any, did any of you go to the Rugby World Cup last year? No, okay, so the Rugby World Cup, we, we held the RFU with an application that allowed people to order beer from their seats on their phone. And I thought it was fantastic, it personally worked a dream for me. Um, so I would order four pints of Guinness, uh, press the button, the bar that I said I wanted it at, bar 26 down the, the block I'm in, uh, they had an express lane because I've already paid with my credit card on the phone, so there's all these other lanes of people queuing up for hours of beer, I went straight to the front, got the four Guinness and went back and sat down and drank them. So we helped them write that application and do it. And that meant that they could sell more beer because they're just racking them up and now they go. They don't have to have the payments done at the till, so the till has fewer staff with the same throughput. What's Tokyo going to be like? So that's another four years from now. You could be walking up to the turnstiles and actually the cameras are, are looking at every person that's coming out to the turnstiles and you just walk in because it knows that Jason's got a ticket to see the fencing semi-finals uh, and I just walk through uh, it could know that I'm near the bar, it could know that I like Guinness so it's got the Guinnesses, it's up to the volume of pre poor Guinness um, I'm actually not paying with anything because I will be walking up to the till and it knows that my phone is in my pocket and who I am or it's recognised my face um, I might not be paying with cash or putting it on my credit card, I might be paying with British Airways uh, air miles that I've just racked up flying over to Tokyo to go to it um, because we've got that transaction going across and I might be able to see this all happening real time uh, coming back to my phone. Do, who has um, Apple Pay? Yeah? Or Google Pay, Samsung. Um, so you see on that now, 
when you do a transaction, it comes through on your app straight away. And it will do that even if you're not doing it on the app. If you use your credit card in a different way and it comes up and tells you the amount. So you start to get more real-time feedback there of what's happening. So we're, we're, we keep trying to visualise how we can make it easier for people to spend money. More people are using their credit cards, fewer people are using cash, that's good for WorldPay because we get a little piece of every one of those credit card transactions. Um, but we're always looking for the win-win. We do that because we want you to have a better shopping experience. We want to make it easier for you to shop, we want to make it easier for you to get the things you want and think less about that. So this is the kind of visualisation we do. Well, let's walk around the Tokyo 2020. How can we help there? We think about the innovation, the ideas that I just spoke about, the, uh, the, the blockchain, uh, about identity, um, and we then feed it back to how can we improve our back-end systems, and that's where boring people like me shovel coal into the servers at the back to try and make the engine go faster. Um, that's payments in a snapshot for you. I hope it was uh, informative. And so I think that the blockchain would be an important part of your future strategy. Are you are you looking into sort of partnering with others? Are you working with any, anyone at the moment? So yes, we, we, we're a lot of the blockchain we're doing ourselves. We, we, do, we have our own innovation team, and so we're working on what the uh, potential applications could be in our part of the value chain about what we do and, and about how we can get more efficient. Uh, would it allow us to be uh, more available. For example, if we had a shared ledger with some of our trusted parties, mm -hmm. could that mean that, you know, could, God forbid, that our data centres came down in a catastrophic, you know, incident, that all of our uh, merchants could carry on doing transactions because they're logging into a shared ledger that's not in our data centre. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to think of less sexy but very practical and useful applications and we're doing that in-house. Um, most of the partnering we're doing in, in a bit of ocean is around the, um, the, the micropayments and around um, the uh, Internet of Things. Where we're, we're, trying to, we're working with uh, Samsung, with Apple, but with uh, ARM and the chip man for Intel about how we can get that technology and help make it easier for the, for the technologists to use payments and, and hopefully we, you know, we drive a standard in how that's done. That's what we like to be seeing yeah. doing. Because definitely, I mean, the way things are going forward, blockchain is going to be a fundamental thing to, to the Internet of Things, really. Yeah. The way it's going to work. So I, I, I suspect that payment will be probably one of the first industries to like, get into it. But I definitely see that other manufacturing and everyone else really getting into blockchain. Just yeah. the idea of simplifying the whole process from financial firms to to, I don't know, solicitors and mortgage advisors and so yeah, on. Yeah, logging things in an efficient way that's easy to distribute and cheap to do is, is, you know, all of these things are, will be good for a lot of value exchange and for transactions. So, yeah, we've, we've got to be in there somewhere. We don't know the killer app for it yet, but... Uh, By 2020, how, how much of the blockchain sort of approach would you have? I, I would be surprised that by 2020 we don't have blockchain, the, the shared ledger, um, built into one of our production BAU processes. Mm. So I think we will have it by then. Um, but I don't, like I said, I don't think it's going to revolutionise the world overnight. I, don't, yeah, I, I think it's going to become another tool, another infrastructure, and it will drive efficiency, um, but it won't, it won't suddenly transform something overnight. Yeah. That's Thank fine. You. Thank you. Well, just like the Internet of Things, really, it's five years ago when industry and some scholars talked about it. People were saying, oh, you know, this is all a bit, a bit complex and so on, but now it's actually starting to happen because the largest companies in the world are building platforms like Google, IBM, Intel. And it's cheap enough, that's the yeah. thing. It's cheap to do the technology so that makes it a company. Thank you. Questions, comments? What numbers at the end of Merchant ID for World Bank? Three. Two. Two. <laughs> they will be checking that out. My receipt nerds, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, again, I want to thank you, Jason, for taking your thank time. Thank you for inviting me. This is fantastic. And again, as I said to students the other week, Feel free to connect with Jason on LinkedIn as well. And yeah. you never know what the future brings to us. 
You know, you might be partnering on blockchain together, you've got no idea. Or there might be opportunities uh, on other things that you might find with, uh, with Jason. So thank you all, thank you for coming along, and thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.